Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Halliday. In the coming weeks, our newsletter is going to be making some very big announcements. We will begin to cover the new positions within the artificial intelligence sector. This is one of the most exciting times for Portfolio Wealth Global since 2017. The alert of Ethereum at $16 and Dash at $35, which made subscribers hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the case. Today, we are thrilled to be speaking with Mr. Jim Willie. Jim is the editor-in-chief and founder of the Hat Trick Newsletter and the GoldenJackass.com website. Jim is highly regarded as one of the leading experts in the gold and silver market, as well as his forecasts on currency-related <coughs> collapses, bank defaults, <coughs> predictions for gold and silver prices, and much, much more. Jim, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing just fine, Michelle. And... Uh you know, we started the rainy season here in Costa Rica, so ah. things just very suddenly get different. And it's been it's been the case for now about two weeks. It, it means every afternoon a pretty good rainstorm. Oh, so nice! I'm trying to adapt to that. I got caught in a rainstorm a few days ago. Absolutely soaking, sopping, soaking wet. <laughs> day at home. How and, wet uh, were you? <laughs> pardon me. Absolutely sopping, soaking wet. Sopping, soaking wet. I must have been an extra 10 pounds of weight from all the water. But, uh, you know, straight to the shower. Make sure you don't get a uh, chill. But uh, <clears throat> I'm doing fine. And uh, I'm noticing we're, we're in an acceleration phase for the global financial breakdown. Hmm. <laughs> we want to cover all of this. It's uh, exciting and rather scary at the same time. It's, if you're not scared, you're not living in reality. <laughs> You've got no clue. Uh, if you don't believe in conspiracies, then I believe you're kind of a Bush-type intelligence moron. <laughs> right. That's how pervasive the conspiracies are. Starting with the JFK kill, hmm. moving on to Black Monday and, and the excuses for that, moving on to 9-11, moving on to Lehman. Everything has been a false narrative for the major, serious, global change type events. Wow. Uh, we're, we're living in the United States. I, mean, I, I assume that's the bulk of your audience. Um, we Americans in the United States have been lied to more than just about any society in modern history. Uh, we're lied to about politics, we're lied to about our leaders, we're lied to about the banking policy, we're lied to about economic statistics and performance, we're lied to on trade policy, we're lied to on wars, we're lied to on vaccines, we're lied to on global warming, we're lied to on everything. Wow. So, it's your show, take it, you've, you've got a list of... Uh, I see 11 questions, and some of them are not easy, some of them are messy, but what do you say we get going? Awesome. <clears throat> Jim, we'll start with the first question. I'd like to start by asking you for your current assessment of the United States economy. Are the perma bears who are calling for the collapse of the U.S. dollar, hyperinflation, and the second Great Depression wrong? In other words, you know, in 2018, the major subprime mortgage crisis, which bankrupted individuals and homeowners who overpaid and overleveraged. But is it the case that that problem with the real estate market cleaned itself out and we are headed toward a brighter future now that we're smarter, realizing that a nationwide mortgage crisis is a possibility so that behavior does not happen again or... Should the bankers have gone to prison for extending loans to people who were clearly not <clears throat> able to pay them back? The bankers should have gone to prison for a number of reasons. Uh, for their poor underwriting, for their fraudulent mortgage bonds, for their incorrect, uh, intentionally incorrect AAA ratings, for their theft of $700 billion in TARP funds, and for the entire MERS title database system, which permitted many, many mortgages to go into more than one, I'm sorry, many, many home loan income streams 
to go into more than one mortgage. Then they should have been put in prison for killing Lehman. Lehman didn't die, it was killed. Uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs bought mortgage bonds and never paid for them. They received the bonds and never paid for them and suffocated Lehman and Lehman died because they didn't get paid by Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. How would you like to sell your house, hand over the title and not get your money? It might cause you a bankruptcy. Would that mean that you suffered a financial failure or that you were killed? Oh. Okay, then Goldman Sachs went on and, and arranged for the failure of AIG so that Goldman Sachs could be paid 100 cents on the dollar for the failed layman bonds that they killed them with. So it was a crime scene. Did we, did we fix anything? Absolutely not. Did we learn anything? Absolutely not. Did we do anything differently? Yes, we did the same policy on subprime and we extended it to the corporate, we extended it to student loan, we extended it to sovereign bonds with QE. So by going to hypermonetary inflation and quantitative easing for the Fed, does that mean that we fixed it? or that we amplified the same subprime problem. We did, we amplified the same subprime problem, Michelle, by making the US Treasury bonds subprime. We didn't fix anything. We extended everything in the same way that we did the mortgage bonds throughout the entire financial system. We brought in car loans that, that are now subprime and put them into asset-backed bonds. We got numerous sovereign bonds that should be at eight and 12%, but are being pushed along with QE in Europe, QE in the United States. Why is Italy under 2% for their 10-year bond? Does that mean that they're healthy or that we did the same thing that we did with the mortgage bonds and we're doing it to the Italian government bonds? The United States has a $1.2 trillion annual deficit. So why are its more, why are its 10-year bonds not over 10%? We didn't fix anything. We had no intention to fix anything. All we intended to do was to maintain the banker control of the U.S. Department of Treasury. And they did that. Are we, what's the condition of the U.S. economy? It's on debt suffocation. Uh, household debt is skyrocketing. Student loans are at two trillion. Car loans are, are now way up there in volume and they're being shoved into uh, AAA asset-backed mortgage bonds where the dummy pension funds don't really care that there's some toxic car loans in there because they're getting yield and the pension funds need yield. Okay, QE killed the main economy. QE preserved, I'm talking about the hypermonetary inflation, bond purchase program, monetizing the US government debt. It preserved the banker power, preserved the liquidity of the Wall Street banks, and slowly suffocated the US economy. Take a look at the 60 to 65% decline in money velocity since Lehman and point anywhere to progress or stimulus. No stimulus whatsoever, except to bank bond trading. That doesn't help mainstream business for plumbing or retail or consulting. They have trouble getting a loan. The big banks say, no, you're not credit worthy. We're not going to give you the loan. Why? Because they realize the economy is stuck in a recession that we never exited from 2006 because we lie on price inflation, which for years was around six, eight, nine percent but we called it two or three. So we lied on the price inflation by about 5% every single year for a long time. 
that meant that our GDP, economic growth estimates, were a lie and were 5% wrong. We've been Every saying time. we're at 2 and 3 <laughs> 5% error in our growth statistic, yes. I mean from 08, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, until the oil price went down. So all the way up to 2014 or 15, we were lying about the CPI by about 5%. We were claiming that the growth statistics, the growth rate, GDP, was about 2 or 3%. Subtract 5 we were dealing with 2 and 3% annual recessions. And it shows. Just take a look at the malls. You cannot blame the malls all on Amazon. It's, it's like, you know, 30% factor with Amazon, maybe 20. The rest is the economy. The economy stinks. Yeah, the malls are completely empty. It's so weird. <laughs> they don't have any money. People are, are struggling and they don't. I, I, one of the biggest comments I get from clients is, I know a lot of people who are losing their jobs. I hope I don't lose mine. I know companies that are closing down in my area. And who are the buyers going to be? It's often Chinese or European company. The economy is not getting better. The economy is getting stifled and suffocated from debt. L just take a quick, quick example. Look at the, the major corporations like General Electric, GE. They, they issue bonds. Well, why? Because they don't have to pay much on the bond yield. I mean, they pay out like 3 or 4%. What are they doing with the money? Are they growing their businesses and hiring people? No, they're doing stock buybacks. We're not fixing anything, Michelle. It's very, very, it's just, it's almost mind-boggling when you really look at all of the equation, you know. Well, look at the, look at the extension of the subprime policies. You have government bonds, not just the United States, but Italy and France. They're being bought by central banks because they don't want the interest rate to go up to eight and 10% and cause an alarm. They don't want to ruin the banks that are holding those bonds. Okay, we've extended subprime everywhere. There's a new name, it's called the everything bond bubble. It's not the subprime mortgage bond bubble anymore. It's the everything bond bubble. Mortgage bonds, sovereign bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, the everything bond bubble. We, wow. I have a name for what's coming and what has begun. It's a systemic layman event. It's not just going to be the mortgage bonds that suffer and people have defaults on their home loans and lose their homes with foreclosures. No, it's going to be entire banking systems like Italy's, like Spain's, the collapse. Did, did Greece's banking system collapse? I know, I know Greece, they were locked out of the banking system, but didn't it revive itself or some, someone revived it? <clears throat> they did bail-ins and they, they bail -ins. Been crippled. Mm -hmm. They had a bank system failure. Mm -hmm. And the Germans came in and exacted their, <clears throat> pardon me, their pound of flesh. German banks came in and said, well, we'll offer you, you know, liquidity and, and, uh, uh, money funds to to sa salvage your banking system to save the key banks, but we're going to require these five big properties. Carpet bagging. The banking system failed in Greece. Next comes the banking system failing in a few other countries because we fixed nothing. There's another little phrase, not not just the everything bond bubble, but it's you got a crisis. Okay, let the elite get paid off, let the public take losses, rinse, and repeat. Don't fix anything. We rinse, corrupt, and repeat. We do it over and over and over and over and over again, and nobody seems to complain because the dimwits are pointing to the stock market. 
The stock market's got new highs. Who's buying stocks? Is it people who are employed? No, it's the Wall Street banks. They're buying they're up the to, stocks. They're trying to prevent the public from waking up. I'm trying to enable the public to wake up. Now, Jim, from your perspective, shifting gears just a little bit, can the legalization of cannabis mm -hmm. revive the bank accounts of the states by bringing high-paying full-time jobs, tax revenues, and decriminalization, or are you against allowing the substance to become legal? I don't really care whether it's legal or not. Um, I think you know alcohol is a far more dangerous drug. How about making illegal the opioids from painkillers? Would that be a good idea? Because that's one of the leading causes of death right now. In 2016, there were 82 million prescriptions of opioid painkillers in Ohio alone with a population of about 12 million. Okay, so what's the dangerous drug out there? I'll tell you what's more dangerous than alcohol or opioids, which is a narcotic. It's medical care with your doctor. They're as culpable and reliable in causing deaths as lung cancer and car accidents. Okay, I don't really care about cannabis being legal, but here's something that you may not know about. If, if you're a Colorado cannabis company or a California cannabis company and you, you've gathered in a few hundred thousand dollars in sales in the last several months, you can't put it in a bank account. So I'm not even sure what your question is all about. Right, what, right. Banking is a huge problem. Where's the tax revenue if you can't even put it in a bank account to buy yourself a home? If you're running a cannabis corporation, that's because the states are in favor of bank deposits from cannabis, but the federal government is not. Not. Because they prefer narcotics. The federal government pre prefers narcotics. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay, now if they want to maybe legalize and reform bank account deposits, which is a very simple concept, then maybe there could be an economic boost and maybe the money could enter the banking system and come out in the form of loans for business expansion beyond the cannabis sector. But let's get to the first base before we talk about, you know, scoring runs. First base is to allow cash from cannabis businesses to be deposited in banks because they can't. Okay, let's move on. It, it's kind of a moot question. Yeah, <laughs> there's a potential there. Yes. But when, when is the system going to wake the hell up? Now, Jim, why, in your opinion, has the price of gold risen from 1050 at its bottom in December 2015 to over 1350? And yet, gold mining companies, from exploration to development and producers, have lagged behind so badly. Oh boy, this is a very thorny question, ah. and I'll try to give it my best answer. Okay. <clears throat> to begin with, um, I don't favor since 2008 mining stocks. I have not, and that has proven to be a pretty good call. I've favored accumulation of gold and silver, in particular, 80% weight of silver. 80% silver, 20% gold. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Silver is required in industry. Gold is not. Well, minimal. Central banks have a lot of gold, and they have no silver. So on the supply side, silver wins. On the demand side, silver wins. That's why its gains are always triple those of gold. Okay. I have not liked the mining stocks for 10 years. My reasons back then still apply. There's too much accounting fraud. There's too many executive option uh, packages that include stocks, big stock option package. There are too many new projects that 
that uh, are paid for with stock issuance. And before any output comes, they issue more stock to purchase, say, a mill. And then the stock all becomes released and the stock goes down. Stock share price goes down 10 to 30 percent without any output. There's a new phenomenon that I'm personally familiar with because a friend of mine who was a different newsletter writer was on Mexican visits for their mining operations, you know, in, in the hills. Uh, and he got stopped because he got stopped by some guys holding machine guns, okay, uh, off the road. Oh, wow. And he was told to get on the ground, in the dirt, in the sand, and he had a boot on his neck, and he had machine guns from three guys standing over them. And if it weren't for a Spanish-speaking bilingual driver, they never would have known what was going on. They were driving a black SUV, but a rival drug cartel captain was also in the area driving a black SUV. So the, the machine gun crew was searching for the rival captain of a different cartel. They wanted to kill him. And the translator told him, oh, no, no, we're just three guys looking to visit the mine up that road. Oh, my so, God. <laughs> about you know, eight more kilometers. So the guys holding the machine gun machine guns, let them go, and said, okay, be careful. Ten cuidado. Ten cuidado. Be careful. Okay, my friend learned later with more investigation that the drug cartel in Mexico has been stealing mine output on a regular and frequent basis, and the mining firms report a falsified output that never mentions the crime. So Mexican mining companies are all vulnerable to cartel bank ro out output robbery. You know, they don't steal everything because they want, <laughs> they want the mining firm to keep it going in operation. They want to come back next month to steal more. So they never steal more than 10 or 20% of the output. Okay, that's never properly accounted. And if you think that's only Mexico, it's never in Peru or Ecuador, you got rocks in your head. Okay, furthermore, there's a little fund called GDX, like George David Xavier. George, GDX is a fund operated by Goldman Sachs. And they use it to short the mining companies. So the mining companies never see a rise in their stock prices. From corrupt accounting, excess stock options, thefts of their output, and Goldman Sachs operating their GDX like a big wet blanket. So why do I not like mining stocks? Because there's nothing about them to like. Except maybe for exceptions like first majestic silver that does not sell all their silver output into the market they hoard it and they're under attack by the u.s government for doing so they're under attack by canadian government for doing so oh no no you have silver output you must sell it into the market yeah says newmar but we don't like the price we're getting so we're putting it in inventory f you so next comes, you know, tax violation audits and, you know, you know the drill. Mm -hmm. Okay. The mining companies might someday be very profitable. They've been closing their marginal mines because they can't make any money on them with a suppressed price. I like silver more than I like mining stocks. Let's just leave it there. Silver okay. bars, silver coins. I bought a whole bunch in 1997 when silver was six and seven dollars. Ooh, a whole bunch! Nice. I knew 
that the story, this is a nice little side story. Okay. A nice little side story of Warren Buffett, the great liar. Okay, we admire Warren Buffett, right? Most people do. Most people do because most people don't know what's going on. Most people are dumb dimwits. But the 10% out there who are not dimwits realize that Warren Buffett is a criminal. Warren Buffett said, we sold our silver position too early. 130 million ounces of silver metal. We sold it too early. He said, he actually said, we sold it around eight too early. No, that was the price, Warren, of your covered calls. You got called away, Warren, you liar. You got called away because he was selling covered calls and making eight or nine percent income per month on his silver position while lying and saying that gold and silver never offer a yield, no income. No, silver offers income from selling covered calls, but if the price rises, you'll be called away and you'll be forced to sell at a low price, and that is not selling early, Warren. That's being called away on a trade that went bad. Wow. Now, you know, Jim, shifting from precious metals and gold into cryptocurrency, let's talk about that phenomenon just for a moment. I like the fact that there is an option of buying an asset which is liquid and can be used as a payment, but is completely outside of the fiat monetary system. But is it sustainable? In 2017, we saw the emergence of crypto projects in the thousands. And the question is what to do with it and can this keep going? This is another thorny question. So we got back to back very Difficult, thorny questions. Um, cryptocurrencies are outside the main banking system. That's true. Uh, can you buy groceries with your crypto account? Not yet. Okay. Well, some places, you know, Jim, online, there are, it, there are some, some stores that are starting up, but they're very few and far between. Very, very few. I think it's way under like 1% of mm -hmm. retail outlets. Um, retail shops. Um, there are mechanisms for converting Bitcoin into an ATM debit card. They do have that. But right now, the great majority, like way over 90% of transactions using cryptocurrencies are for buying something online. Furthermore, two years ago, the fee used to be 1% or 2%, 1.5%. Now the fees are between 7 and 10% of the transaction. That's not what I call a favorable fee. That's true. Okay. Now you've got clowns like Bix, Bix Weir out there saying gold is dead, Bitcoin is it. Uh, he, he said that and pounded the table as loud as he could right before the 60% decline of Bitcoin. And it's still declining. So... I, I invite people to jump off that stagecoach that's going into the ravine and maybe hop onto the hat trick letter at the Golden Jackass because the comics is breaking right now. Okay, crypto is also subject to entire governments saying no transactions are legal anymore saying no crypto account is transferable anymore to saying you've got income tax obligations on your capital gain. I actually have a client who wrote to me about three months ago, it was right after the decline, powerful decline in, in, in uh, February. He said, Jim, it's incredible. I've got a friend who just received from his government, it was not the United States, from his government, a tax bill of $107,000 for crypto gains. And he said, my friend doesn't even have an account worth that much. Now, if you know tax law, the burden of proof is on the person. 
Oh, that's so crazy. So how would you like to have a nice <laughs> big fat crypto account and get a tax bill for twice your account from the U.S. government and you can't pay the, the bill because your account is worth much less than the bill, but the burden of proof is on you and they're going to take your house. Okay, these are the horror stories. On the other hand, cryptocurrencies in general do have a big role coming up. I don't think it's going to be as cash. I think it's going to be as foundation for business functions. For instance, Veritasium. It is a, a token. It is a, a, uh, a cryptocurrency. And it is the basis for lots and lots of different functions for creating a business, operating a business, running payroll, running invoices, and doing the entire supply chain. Okay, you've got, oh gosh, there's one that, that does the invoicing. Oh, I can't think of the name of it. <clears throat> um, there are probably about 80 very big and important uh, functional tokens. I call them function tokens. They're also called utility tokens. Uh, they're not for cash. Like Ethereum and Bitcoin, those are like for cash. And the fact that Bitcoin went up 20-fold in a couple of years is not testimony to its value. It's testimony to its vulnerability for a crash, which happened. Now, I've got a Bitcoin account. It's, it's less than $1,000. It's just jumping around like, a, like an insane little kid. Uh, I, I expect it'll be cut in half. Okay, I've got some very smart people who think that you know, once things get settled out and, and organized and, and treaties are made and you know, deals are cut and laws are made more clear and more, more fair, that Bitcoin might resume its rise and get up to 100,000. I'm not in that group. Uh, I think silver is going to make those gains. Ah, okay, okay. Silver is so much better than any bond, silver is so much better than any crypto. To be sure, I've got I've got three guys who are advising me. They're they're all over the place. They're in South America, they're in Europe, and they're in uh, Central America, and another one's in Canada. Four, and and they give me lots of information, and and they talk to me about how you know, Jim, I I moved about uh, you know twelve hundred dollars into these eight small utility tokens you know, a little over $1,000, and now it's worth about, you know, 80000 And it's only been about 8 or 12 months. Uh, like a little one that I bought at, at $0.03, cents and now it's $36. Uh, it's still in the shadows, mm -hmm. but with a good story, a good theme. It's the utility tokens, the functional tokens that are really where it's at. Uh, and, and each country has a different policy, whether it's hostile or friendly. They each have an attitude, and it's affecting the entire crypto space. So I'm not going whole hog in the, into this, but I don't believe the future is with cryptocurrencies for holding cash. I think it's the cryptocurrencies that will fulfill a utility function. Nice. And those will shine. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Now, Jim, will the escalation of millennials' demand for new homes, cars, services, and consumer spending spark a resurgence for the U.S. economy domestically here at home? Not in the slightest. Ah, uh, oh. Okay. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. You've got to be drunk on Jack Daniels to think that. Uh, the first requirement is the millennials have to have money. They don't. Many of them are living with their parents. Many are living with a group. Many of them have never held a job. Many of them are holding student loans that have more zeros than they have years. 
Yeah, that's the killer, really, Jim, is the student okay. loans amongst millennials. Okay, so what will drive any kind that the millennials are your new bankrupt group? They're your new demographic group that never joined the business world that never accumulated wealth outside of cryptos and will never buy a house. That's my view of millennials. Millennials are the, the guys who are walking across the street doing text messages, not noticing that there's traffic about to mow them down. That's the millennial mindset. Oblivious. Millennials are the ones who have their pants below their undergarments who cannot even get through the door for a job interview. Millennials are the ones who advocate cannabis to legalize and might run a company, but will never have a bank account. Millennials are the ones who never heard of the Vietnam War and never heard of my old company, Digital Equipment Corporation. Millennials, in my opinion, will be the lost demographic group. Now, what will drive any kind of a U.S. economy resurgence toward the year 2025? The reindustrialization re of the United States. Ah, could you expound on that, please? I will by explaining the most grand and egregious and horrendous error the United States ever committed in economic policy. Oh, okay. Outsourcing industry in the 1980s. Mm. Why is that not in the news? Because we don't understand economics. We're following the stock market like a bunch of blurry-eyed morons. We outsourced Intel's chip fabrication labs that used to be in California. We sent them to the Pacific Rim. That was the 1980s. I was at Digital Equipment Corporation, a major computer manufacturer and software developer and you know, service provider at the time. And five or six of us sat around reading the Wall Street Journal, talking about Intel's move, and we concluded as a group, this is suicide. Wow. And I said to them, you know what? I've had a little economics. I don't have a degree, but... I took a few courses, and I read the Wall Street Journal a lot. I read Barron's a lot. I've learned a lot. You never abandon your legitimate industry for its income. Germany didn't, and they still have surpluses. United States outsourced, and we got a $21 trillion deficit. So what was the mistake, Michelle? Outsourcing industry, which in the 90s accelerated. In 1986, we had Black Monday. You may not make the linkage, but Black Monday is linked to the beginning of outsourcing. We gave up our legitimate industry, and now we need to bring it back because the United States is caught in, in one gigantic vice and pickle. We need a legitimate currency because the global currency reserve is going away. The oil trade is not 100% in the dollar anymore. Americans don't even realize that. Americans don't know jack shit about what's going on with the economy or financial world. They know what's going on with cryptos and they know the S&P stock index. Not much else. Jim, could you expound upon the importance of the petrodollar, what it's meant to the United States and what it's going to mean to us to lose it? It, it means that for 40 years, we could give up our industry and we could pay for all our imports with IOUs called treasury bonds. It means we could live beyond our means. What are our means? What we produce, what our legitimate income is. Not on our mutual fund stock gains. We gave up our industry. We're in a giant pickle right now. The global trade, the global currency reserve means that trade payments across the globe are done in US dollar terms. And as a consequence, the reserves and banking systems are US treasury bonds. 
So global currency reserve means dollars used for trade payments and bank reserves. That's both going away. Okay, we're in a giant pickle. Let me explain this pickle before we go to the next topic because this is, this is central to the problem facing the United States and the risk we have, not of economic revival, but of third world. Third world. We gave up our industry. We're relying on printed money to cover our government deficits. It's exactly what Zimbabwe did. But... Now it's better because we do it? No, we lost our bond investors, so we went to QE and the bond purchase program to keep the Wall Street banks from dying because they wanted to control the U.S. government. Right, here's the pickle we're in. If we issue a legitimate asset-backed dollar, we're going to have to deal with forfeiting assets every single year until we get rid of the trade deficit. Americans don't even focus on the trade deficit. It's 560 billion last year, and it's going to be over 600 billion this year. Let me put it into perspective in oil and in perspective of, of uh, gold. If, the, if we maintain a $1,300 gold price and we go to a gold backed new dollar because we lose the, the monopoly that we have in the dollar globally, then in the first year, we lose 13,000 tons of gold because we have a trade deficit. And an asset-backed currency means you must pay at the end of the year or at the end of each quarter to, to make ends meet. You can't be a freeloader. The reset is in progress and it's going to eliminate the freeloading countries. We don't have legitimate income. We have stock trading income. We have crypto trading income. We have other income from cannabis. We have other income from, you know, you know, debt relief firms. We have more income from bankruptcy counseling. We have more income from retail liquidation. We don't have it from production. Okay. That was the gold analogy, 13,000 tons at a $1,300 price. That's one year, Michelle. The second year would be all over again. So do you think somebody's going to say, I'd like to put up my gold for the U.S. government to back their new dollar? Hell no. No. <laughs> okay. The other right. millions in the crowd with small brain stems say, no, we can back the new dollar with oil. We got a strategic petroleum reserve. Oh, really? Well, I did some simple napkin math, and it came out to be approximately $8 billion for the entire strategic oil reserve. So in the first year, if we back our new dollar by oil, we need 80 strategic petroleum reserves. So we either lose 13,000 tons of gold or 80 strategic petroleum reserves in the first year. You think the oil companies are going to put up that oil to back a new dollar? Hell no. Okay, we need to reindustrialize the United States before we can have a legitimate currency because we need to eliminate the trade deficit which must be forfeited in asset terms each year with a legitimate currency that's not a freeloader. When Walmart and Target empty their goods at the port, how do we pay the Asians? Treasury bills. Michelle, I got news for you. They don't want it anymore because we're printing it. They don't want our treasuries anymore. They want real money. And they're concluding the dollar's not real money. Why? Because we're printing it to cover our federal U.S. government debt, just like Zimbabwe did. How did that turn out? Well, I've got a $10 trillion Zimbabwe dollar bill to show you. Mm. $10 trillion. How do you like what's going on in Venezuela? 
They had a currency crisis. Yeah, that's just terrifying. That's, uh... I've seen a graph, one of the most interesting charts I've seen from uh, Venezuela regarding finances is what's the, co the cost of a cup of coffee in Caracas? It, it's up like 300 fold in the last two years. Okay, uh, this is the risk for the U.S. Now, I've been told, and, and there are a number of very popular writers out there who have written that Trump has a, uh, a method, he has a project, and it's, it seems like it's a success for recovering over $20 trillion of stolen money by the U.S. elite. I mean, ju just to begin with, the day before 9-11, Secretary of, of uh, the Defense Donald Rumsfeld announced that there was $2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon. Okay, and that was a, a report from the U.S. Army Accounting Office. Does anybody realize that the Pentagon was struck precisely ground zero at the U.S. Army Accounting Office? And that 70% of all the dead soldiers in the Pentagon from 9-11 were accounting officers. Okay, so it was a cover-up. It was a smash. Uh, I, I have actually met one military person here in Costa Rica. It was in 2009 during Christmas watching an NFL game in a sports bar, and he told me, yeah, and we got talking, one thing led to another. He said, yeah, I, I served in the U.S. Army, and I said, where? And he said, well, I was in New Jersey sometime, but I was at the Pentagon uh, for all of 2001. I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah. He said, there was a missile that hit the U.S. Army Accounting Office, but there was also 100 pounds of CMAX that were placed right in the center of the U.S. Army Accounting Office. So that report never was published, so to speak. Now, the reason I bring that up is that was back in 2001. 2.3 trillion was missing from the Pentagon. Well, it's now seven. Did we fix anything? No. Okay, now you have a Michigan State professor who's examined four important U.S. government offices. Defense, housing, urban development, because that's where Fannie Mae is. Fannie Mae is just a giant crime scene. Uh, Bush Sr., and Clinton stole $1.6 trillion from Fannie Mae. Uh, that's fully documented by Catherine Austin Fitz, who was the auditor and who was told by her superiors, shut up, don't publish this, or something is likely to happen to you. And it did. She survived uh, a couple of murder attempts. Okay, you don't reveal the government crime. Uh, anyone who tries to testify against the Democratic National Committee is, uh, and, and against Hillary is found dead. You know, like a shotgun wound from 10 yards away called suicide. Right. Uh-huh. So that, that has not stopped. Seth, Seth is dead. Uh, I can't think of his last name. Seth. Rich. Rich, right. Seth Rich. And that was all called suicide. Everybody's, okay, the, the rate of suicide in U U.S. politics is something like 10 times higher than any other country. That's because they're murdered. Okay, we need to make a legitimate economy, Michelle. We cannot say, as Greenspan did, we're gonna make a financial engineering economy that will be the world's envy. We're not the world's envy. We're the world's enmity. We've earned its wrath, we've earned its disgust, and we've earned its isolation. That's what's coming, isolation. We're trying to sanction Germany right now for building the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to connect the Russian gas prop. We're trying to sanction German construction and finance companies, and Germany's telling us, back off. At the St. Pete Economic Forum that started last week, the French signed over $20 billion in contracts with Russia. So would you say the Russian sanctions are dead? Okay, we're not the world leader anymore. China is. We're not the model of, of economic power. China is. We're not the model of, e of financial structure and legitimacy anymore. That replacement remains to be seen. 
we're getting isolated by sanctioning everybody. I had a joke three years ago. I said, we're going we're gonna to have the U.S. government with its military defend the dollar, and we're going to sanction a lot of countries, and it's possible we might sanction more than half the countries in the world to protect the dollar, to protect our right to import and pay with printed goofy money that no one wants, Monopoly to maintain money. our government debt monetization schemes because bondholders don't show up at auctions for the treasury. There's not been one treasury auction ever, Michelle, that's been a failure. Why is that? Because we buy our own with printed money. Greece had failed auctions. Italians had failed auctions. We never do. Because in the crowd, we put ourselves at the auction. You know, we, we, we deserve a 30% currency devaluation every year. So, wow. U.S. economy will revive when we decide to reindustrialize. So when there is hope. There is hope, Jim, right, for our country. Well, there is hope, but, you know, Trump ran on a campaign for a trillion-dollar infrastructure program, and he immediately switched it over to a military budget increase. Where, where is the beginning? I want to see a goal, a national goal, of twenty to 30,000 new businesses created every year in free trade zones in all 50 states with an emphasis to export one third of the output. We're headed for a situation where we're gonna have food shortages because we export it. That's where we're heading. And you know, young people, they're getting an inkling that something's wrong. And that's why many of them don't wanna join the system. They'd, they'd rather be, you know, working in the shadows, you know, working without paying taxes, no withholding taxes. Um, I feel sorry for the young people in the United States. Take a look at graduation figures and how many, what percent get job offers. I mean, it's fallen down to something like 10 or 15 percent. In 1980, I got three job offers after finishing my doctorate in statistics. You know, one of them was a weird offer at the Department of Transportation where the idiots wanted to develop a, a great new urban bus. <laughs> okay, and I thought, you guys are really screwed in the head. <laughs> Thanks for your offer, but uh, I think I'll go get a real job. <laughs> so I, I worked for a computer company that was you know, a global leader. Now, I feel sorry for kids. What are they going to do? Uh, many, many of the loans now for student loans, Many of them are, are just enormous in size. There was a story that just got circulated of a, of a, a dentist in Utah who has a million dollars of student loans. Wow. Whoa. And, and this, okay, you'd think, oh, gosh, that must be really rare. No, I bet you there are 180 stories like that. Wow. So, Okay. There's not going to be an economic revival unless we reindustrialize, and there's not going to be any gold back or asset back legitimate currency that other countries will want unless we reindustrialize. So the key is that we build up our economy again and reverse this asinine, suicidal pact with the devil that Jake, what was his name? Um, David Rockefeller began. The Rockefeller Institute started the entire policy of outsourcing. The satanic bastard, David Rockefeller, advised breaking up the family, outsourcing industry, and a whole lot of other things like corporate takeovers of Monsanto. And very few people realize that the, the Rockefeller monopoly in energy for oil was extended into medicine and big pharma. The Rockefellers own half of Big Pharma. Do you think it's a coincidence that liability for deaths from vaccines was eliminated by the Congress? Oh, it was. There's no, there's no liability for vaccine deaths. There's no liability at all. 
I did not know that. Oh, yeah. And not just deaths, but for, say, paralysis. I got a quick story to tell you. In 2008, the swine flu, they call it uh, virus porciala here. Um, swine flu was making the rounds. And uh, there was advice for the schools to uh, indoctrinate the kids to, to take the swine flu vaccine. And I had a gal who had a number of uh, aunts, and they all had kids. And I gathered the aunts around one day and spoke to them in my best Spanish. And my gal translated some of it. And I said, do not take the swine flu vaccine because it contains the virus. This is what Rockefeller has done. The swine flu virus vaccine in the U.S. South killed 50,000 people in 2008 and 9, not in the news, because Rockefeller said don't put it in the news. Now he's dead, so a lot of things are changing. But here's what happened with the various, there were about, oh, I'd say 12 little uh, nieces and nephews. And you're talking about innocent little kids, they're like eight, 10 years old. All of them told their teachers, no, I don't want the vaccine, I'll be fine. But one in a distant suburb didn't get the word. And it's sad. It's very sad. She lives in San Ramon, and she's still drooling on her chest. She has mental paralysis from taking the swine flu vaccine. I've got 80 to 100 messages from clients who say, I wish I never had my my." eight-year-old little girl or my 10-year-old little boy given a vaccine booster because now I had to take him out of school. Paralysis, drooling, never a member of society again, never have a family, never have a normal life. Okay, there's another quick story. It has to do with the Gates and Soros laboratories of West Africa. They were making the Ebola vaccine, except they were putting Ebola in the vaccine. And the natives discovered, wait a minute, what's going on? The only people who are dead are the ones who took the vaccine. Let's go kill all the Red Cross workers. And they did. Ghana, Sierra Leone, and one other country. Okay. Now Gates is something of a wanted man. Gates was responsible for the polio vaccine to go to India. The only trouble is they put polio in the vaccine. You got 100,000 paralysis cases in India, all of them looking to do lawsuits against Bill Gates and his foundation. These foundations are elite globalist foundations which further along the genocide that's been going on that you see in the skies in a very visible way in the form of chemtrails. The Californians are the most advanced. I don't know where, what state you're talking from. California, Michelle. yes. <laughs> okay. Northern California is the region with the most education, awareness, and discussion of the damage from chemtrails. I just put in, a, in the May report a little feature on, uh, I'll just focus on chemtrails because there's so much going on in California being targeted. California is under absolute assault. Uh, in Northern California, around Mount Shasta, do you know what the normal level of aluminum uh, it, particles is in rainfall? How many grams per liter? You know, I don't. Exactly I don't. zero. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. So whenever you see it, you know something's wrong. Okay. Okay. Since 2007, up to two years ago, there was a 10 or 15 fold increase in the amount of aluminum in the Mount Shasta area rainfall. And on Mount Shasta, it's 1,000 times. And the number of Parkinson's and Alzheimer cases is up tenfold because that's the aluminum-based degenerative cranial disease. Okay, the chemtrails contain aluminum particles. We're told to shield us from the global warming, except the opposite is the case. We've got a solar minimum that has begun. We're starting to cool. 
So all the global warming nonsense is to accelerate the cooling. It's heinous. I got one client who said, Jim, I'm going to keep you informed because I'm an ex-ambassador to a small country. And uh, I, it was kind of a mistake to be an ambassador for that whole experience. But what a bunch of benefits to be able to attend the elite meetings. And he attended the 2016 September France meeting on global warming. And he walked away, he said, Jim, I was just dumbfounded. Open discussion of purchasing corrupted scientific research to back up the global warming. Global warming is a sham. Wow. It's, it's to accelerate the cooling. And they say aluminum particles, you know, prevents some sunlight from coming through. But it falls to the ground. And it's in the, in the rainwater. I got a different client in New Mexico who said once a week I cleaned off all the, all the aluminum powder from my vegetable garden leaves. And I had the powder analyzed, and it was aluminum. Aluminum leads to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We don't have chemtrails in, so in Costa Rica. We have very, very rare ones, and it's always in the same area, right over the dairy region. So they want it in the cow milk. They want it in the cheese. But we don't have much. I personally have never seen in 11 and a half years here, never seen a chemtrail in Costa Rica. Never. But I've got friends who are up in Guanacaste, a beautiful Northwest Pacific region. And they say, yeah, you know, once a month or so, I see a couple streaks. That's it's not, it's not much. Anyway, it's, 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 it's all very ugly. I, I, I heard a very funny uh, little story that the elite globalists who are in control of the dollar and control of banks and control of big pharma and control of energy firms, and control of Monsanto and control of Halliburton, the big globalist firms, they do believe in God and they want a currency that's backed by God. Gold, oil, and drugs. Uh, I get you. Jim, this has been amazing. You are a fascinating guest. I didn't even cover a third of my questions, but this has just been... Well, why don't you close off with one of your, your favorite remaining ones, and I'll give oh. you a quick answer, I promise. Okay, all right. Um, you know, I actually was going to ask you whether you thought that a cryptocurrency backed by gold was a good idea, but yes. I would like to hear your take on that. <clears throat> yes, I, I don't even call them cryptocurrencies. Um, the Voice, who is a, a sage uh, advisor and, and member of my team, he calls them crypto money. Currencies yeah. are not valid by definition. Uh, because they're not backed by anything. Crypt what's crypto backed by? Electronic work? That's what we're told. Are they backed by gold? Are they backed by silver? Are they backed by platinum? Are they backed by a, a raft of uh, metals or commodities? Are they backed by grains? Yeah. No, they're backed by electronic work. And the work to validate blockchain transactions last year resulted in more electricity usage than the entire Danish economy. Okay, so verification is not easy, and uh, you know I get I get some people give me these weird opinions that you know Jim the U.S. economy is going to get revived just by verification of of cryptocurrency transactions. I said, oh yeah, right. We'll all be sitting around counting our crypto wallets and buying online through Amazon and having a little robot helicopter drop off our meals and our clothing. Okay, crypto money is going to be a rage. Crypto money might result in a 90% decline in, in Bitcoin because Bitcoin can't compete against a gold back. A gold backing is, is strong. Just look at Venezuela. They're talking about a new Bolivar cryptocurrency that will really be crypto money that will be backed by oil. Okay, when it's backed by something tangible and, and you know, big and marketable like oil, remember gold oil, drugs. I'm looking to see if 
the CIA folks are going to have new crypto money backed by narcotics. <laughs> I'm not laughing. You are. I'm not laughing. Really? Okay. Yeah. The, in, in many Wall Street banks, if they're short on overnight deposits, they use a packet of heroin, a 10 kilo packet of heroin. Okay, it is used in the banking system. How do they use it? To put on a shelf to prove that they got an asset for an overnight requirement for moving money. They don't move the heroin. The heroin is the overnight backing in the vault. Okay, let me leave that topic alone. Wow, yeah. Okay, wow. We're, we're the producers in Afghanistan. We're not killing the Taliban who oppose heroin. No, we're killing the rival groups who are not part of our heroin production. You've got a 15-fold increase in heroin in Afghanistan just since we got there. And by the way, we got there three years before we say we got there. We say we got there in 2003. No, we got there before 9-11 to start up the heroin business. So why do you suppose Big Pharma likes that? Well, gosh, they got a tenfold decrease in their cost for all their opium. And now you got states in resistance saying, wait a minute, you can't, you can't, have, a, you can't have all these pharmaceutical prescriptions for pain-killing opioids. Okay, so crypto money is going to be real. Uh, I think Russia and China are going to push this. Uh, I think the Swiss at the Bank for International Settlements, which is the, the Uber Central Bank, you know, they mm -hmm. make the Basel Rules, for instance. That's Bank for BIS, Bank for International Settlements. They actually like gold, but they also like centralized power. So they're going to come up with a solution that might be a gold-backed crypto, crypto money, mm -hmm. but they're going to screw the pooch and mess it all up by demanding centralized power and no transparency. If you know anything about crypto, if you know anything about blockchain, you know there are two rules that can never be violated. Decentralization and transparency. transparency. And the bankers who want to replace the dollar are going to look for minimal transparency and full centralization. There's a funny little story. Uh, JP Morgan, about a year, a year and a half ago, issued a uh, centralized cryptocurrency and it fell 95% in its first two months. Oh, wow. It was centralized. Uh -huh. JP Morgan control. They right. violated the rule and then the whole market knew it. The crypto market is smart. Yes. <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> okay. So, you know, I, I do like crypto money. And in fact, I think we're going to start seeing more and more of them. And as you do, it's going to raise different questions. Now, I'm a thorough analyst, Michelle. If you've got a cryptocurrency backed by gold, silver, platinum, diamonds, or even crude oil, you're going to have to fulfill two responsibilities. One is custodial oversee, over what we call it, uh, overview, C custodial protection. Who's going to be the official custodian? The second is, who's going to be the independent audit? And will it be centralized for the world or will you have regional centrals, centers? I think that when, you have, when you're going to have the, the asset-backed cryptos, you're going to see a new wave of regionalized vaults. And when it comes to oil, regionalized silos. And you're going to have official sponsored independent audits who are not from the United States because they're all corrupt. We, we can't even, we can't even count on our debt rating agencies. They use that as a political weapon. We're downgrading the Russian bonds. Why is that? Because we don't like them because they're, they're evil because they, they interfered with our elections and, and they're, 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 they're bad and they talk funny. Oh, I tell you, the, the, Russian, the Russians have a, a great cause for uh, labeling the United States a rogue nation with war crimes. And that's what's coming. But uh, I, I, I'm excited by the, the crypto money coming up. I'm very excited by it. I know a, a couple people who are actually working on projects like that. 
and they they promise to keep me informed. I think they're That's they're going wonderful. to be well, they're going to be big hits. But you know, I, I'm also looking at, at the crypto utilities. Uh, we got to get the utilities working. Um, I keep I keep getting told that there's going to be a very big wave, a very big story coming up for crypto money that will replace the dollar standard globally. And it's hard to get information on it. The Bank for International Settlement, the Basel Group in Switzerland, they don't really publish what their plans are because they want all their elite friends to get you know get the investment first and become billionaires and you know increase their wealth a few fold because they're holding a lot of sovereign bonds right now. They're going to get wrecked. Just look at the U.S. Fed and the Euro Central Bank. They got together $9 trillion worth of toxic treasury bonds and euro bonds. How are they going to get out of that? That jam. I'll tell you how. They're going to start buying gold quietly, not tell you, continue to put out goofy, nonsensical reports that gold is valueless, and the central banks are going to be the big winners with gold will overcome their losses in the sovereign bonds. Uh, exciting times coming and it's, you know, it's just, just dangerous at the same time. Yes. Very fraud, dangerous, very scary, but exciting. It, the fraud and criminality is going to hit a peak. Jim, this, as I said before, has been an amazing interview. Please very briefly tell us about your website, your newsletter and how everybody can follow your work. In April 2004, started the newsletter. Uh, I had written about a year or so various articles about gold and its its value and its its role in the financial structure and world. And uh, I, I kept getting more and more invitations to write more. And finally, I decided I'm going to start a newsletter. So I started it, and uh, you know, I had some hardly ambitious goals at the start. Uh, I wanted to cover my home costs, you know, then I wanted to match my last salary. Then I wanted to hit hundred K you know, the usual things. Um, but it started out and it, it has evolved in its current form. There is a monthly newsletter. Um, it's the global gold reset report because we have started the reset. The reset means the dollar is being replaced as a global currency reserve. The reset is the process of replacing the dollar as the global currency reserve. So we've seen the Shanghai event with the gold, oil, and yuan currency contracts for futures. That goes directly on the path of the reset. It goes in opposition to the dollar. Okay, so the reset has begun. I got the, the one report per month, and uh, my, my frequent practice nowadays is to come up with a, a special report that just doesn't fit exactly into finance and economics. Uh, like two months ago, I, I had a report on uh, medicine and, and big pharma and how it was all corrupted and made into a monopoly to benefit the Rockefellers. <clears throat> Very few people understand this. Did, did you know, for instance, that the Rockefellers own half of big pharma stock? Did you know, for instance, that one third of all medical school costs in the United States are paid by big pharma. Did you know that all natural remedies are banned by licensed US medical professionals? And if they recommend something as simple as turmeric to alleviate inflammation, they lose their medical license because big pharma sells anti-inflammation drugs it costs eighty dollars a bottle. Did you know that they cannot recommend uh, MSM glucosamine chondroitin for MSM glucosamine chondroitin? It's a simple pill you can buy in the supermarket, <clears throat> yeah. and alleviates all arthritis, friction in your joints. I had left knee surgery and. 2000, no, 1991, 1993. So now I'm, I've had 25 years with this bad knee reconstructed. But when I don't take MSM glucosamine chondroitin, I cannot go down a staircase. Mm. When I do take it, 
I don't even notice that I'm going down a staircase. I'm on my bicycle often and I just roam around. Sometimes I get caught in the rain. <clears throat> so the newsletter is once a month and it's a six month subscription. There are some frequent, pardon me, frequent sideline uh, special reports. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of work. I do cover the crypto some. I, I wish I had time to cover more, but there's so much going on with this reset and then I call them the non-dollar platforms. You know, like the Belt and Road Initiative. Do, do many Americans or even people who are listening to this, do they understand that the Belt and Road Initiative for, for construction and infrastructure projects that is being managed by Beijing and the Chinese government, the Belt and Road Initiative has $8 trillion in projects lined up and none of it is in the dollar? Okay, the dollar is not the monopoly anymore. There's a new competitor to bank-to-bank -to -bank transactions, which is from SWIFT, the Society of Worldwide International Financial Transactions, SWIFT. They've got now the CIPS. They should have called it CHIPS, but they, they call it the Cross-Border Interbank Payment System. Mm. It's also called the Chinese Interbank Payment System, CIPS. Non-dollar, and it's faster, and it's cheaper, and no sanctions like we have done against our enemies to the dollar like Iran. Iran nuclear program, don't make me barf. Iran nuclear program, you've got to be kidding. No, they're selling oil and gas, not in the dollar. Therefore, they're bad guys. They're bad, very bad guys, and they're terrorists. Right, all right, you wanna find terrorists? Look to Saudi Arabia in their war in Yemen. <clears throat> You want to find, find terrorism? Look at U.S. action in Syria. There's $200 billion worth of damage to the Syrian economy done by the U.S. and Israeli militaries. Why? Because they're terrorists? No. No. Because there's a big oil deposit in Syria and the Mediterranean that Israel wants. And they don't want to share it with anybody. So they don't mind killing half humans subhumans they don't care now anyway i got uh, some special reports <laughs> sorry i'm a rambling fool <clears throat> no, you're fascinating this is just it's been an outstanding like i said i wish i had more time um especially what? since we didn't get to half the questions i'd really be interested to know well, your we only missed a few we, yes okay good ones the, the deep the deep state operators well i'll tell you where the deep state operators are they're hidden in the twenty two thousand sealed indictments that, that, that trump is hesitant to use and open but they just did open it on podesta podesta is one of the main ringleaders of the child sex rings and by the way pedophilia is a nice word to put in the press because I don't want to put child murder sacrifice to Satan. Pedophile sounds better than satanic child ritual killing with unmarked graves. So and Jim, usually you from a that, home. Jim, do you, you believe that this has been, is not just a conspiracy theory? This is part of U.S. politics. The Clintons are at the middle of it. Anyone who tries to come forward against Hillary is found dead. There are 15 to 17 murders just since the early part of 2016, all of them related to Hillary exposure. There were three in one week. Seth Rich was one of them. People to testify before Congress. If they want to kill somebody, a good way to do that is to put a subpoena to testify before Congress against Hillary. He's dead. He never testified. The, the, nobody testifies against Hillary. Anyway, uh, the, Trump is a pretty darn good chess player, and he has an excellent knack for coming across as a bit of a boob. <laughs> yes, he does sometimes. He does. He's a folksy <laughs> boob. But, uh, you know, think of where he came from. He came from casinos, hotels, and bankruptcy. So he, still, he was still in business. So where are his friends? 
They're in casinos, they're in hotels, and they're in bankruptcy. They're bankers. He's got friends who are bankers. He's also got friends who are in the Pentagon. Uh, I think he's using these sealed indictments to prevent uh, prevent the, the, the global reset from becoming the domain of the globalists, uh, the elite, the ones who own the, the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a good question to go away with for some of your audience is, who owns the Federal Reserve? Most people say, I have no idea. That's the way they want it. Because right after Lehman, they issued themselves $23 trillion of near 0% loans. I, I'd like just, you know, a $5 million 0% loan. Yep, I would yeah, take that. Okay. Well, you can make it a quarter of 1%. That's okay. I don't mind. And, and no, I'll go out and buy all kinds of assets that are producing income with that. And I won't worry about even paying it off. These guys are they're criminals, they're killers, and they've orchestrated all the world wars. That's who Trump is trying to unseat. And I wish him luck. I hope he doesn't get knocked off. I wish him luck. I, I, I think he's got a very difficult task, and he's let it be known in some of his tweets that some of the unsealed, um, no, sorry, some of the sealed indictments will never be unsealed because they're worth more kept closed. Interesting. Okay, it's like a threat. You threaten your husband with something, Michelle, but it's best never to execute on the threat because the threat has value. You can get him to change his behavior with your threat. But if you show your threat and you, and you reveal it, he's going to conclude, oh, is that all it is? Well, I don't have to worry <laughs> That's about all you that. Got. <laughs> I, can, I can do that all day and Michelle won't bother me anymore. That's right. And I'll get her to do this and get her to do that. And No, she's, that's an empty threat. And besides, <laughs> right. it's exaggerated. Okay. A threat unused is worth more. Interesting. And when I make a threat sometimes, I, I, I make very sure that it, I do not come close to needing to use it. Ever to use it. <laughs> no, no, no. Do Great not tip. use it. Jim, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on this show. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope I don't sound too... What's the word? I don't like the word crazy. Um, I hope I don't sound too enthusiastic and overboard on the level of, corru of corruption and depravity because it's far more than most people think. Ke Lincoln did not die for emancipating the slaves. He was killed by London bankers for not borrowing London banker money for the Civil War. John Kennedy was not killed for the Bay of Pigs fiasco in Cuba. He was not killed for going after the mafia. He was killed because he wanted to have a silver certificate for the dollar. We've got three or four presidents who've been assassinated over 100 years ago. All of them had something in, in common called the gold standard. They advocated the gold standard. McKinley and Buchanan, both the gold standard. Two or three other presidents were murdered by poison, like Millard Fillmore. Oh, my gosh, he died in his first month in office. Yeah, he wanted to institute some changes that the elite did not want, and they killed him with poison. Okay, there have been more American presidents killed than any country in modern history, and they're almost all by the elite globalists for opposition to the banker cabal. London, European, New York. These things are going to change, and I don't know what kind of upheaval is coming. There's some who think, oh, gosh, you know, Trump's going to manage this pretty nicely. And I said, is he going to reindustrialize the United States economy because we got a $600 billion trade deficit? That's a, 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 a prerequisite for anything. And they say, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I say, okay, then you don't know. Yeah, you don't know. <clears throat> anyway, it's... Dangerous times, Michelle. I'm I'm worried. I, I tell you, I don't I don't sleep real well um, because I I know a lot about what's happening and it's very disruptive. And it's going to be very it's going to be very near impossible for people 
to completely protect themselves. If they think that, oh gosh, you know, I've got a very big mutual fund account and I got a very big crypto account, I'll be fine. You're delusional. We live in some incredible times, Jim. Gold and silver will, will be left standing. Hmm. Uh, crypto money will be left standing. I don't know about cryptocurrencies. The crypto utility functions will be left standing. I'm pretty sure of that. But this is, this is going to be pretty horrible the next few years. Hmm. The reset means the United States is going to have to pay its freight. Right now, we don't. I mean, we get politicians, Michelle, who think that, you know, all we need is to put enough money, government money, in people's hands, and they'll keep the economy going. My gosh, what kind of economic heresy and stupidity is that? We don't need to put welfare money in people's hands. We need to reindustrialize, make companies, make businesses, hire managers, produce things, export, and have a payroll. Payroll. Does anybody in the economic sector know what a payroll is? <laughs> it sounds like a good plan. It's a log logical plan. Logistically logical is what I was trying to say. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on. And, and the website is www.goldenjackass.com. Um, I put a lot of free stuff there. It's on the main page, the public domain page. A lot of interviews. I try not to do a second interview unless there's a link provided for the previous one so my followers can check it out. Okay. Uh, I've, I've done well on YouTube, but now YouTube has gotten corrupted. There's a lot of plagiarized stuff. And, and this, this interview is today, May 29th. Yes, it is. Yes, sir. Uh, you, well, you might find this interview, my point, Michelle, you might find it four months ago, four, four months later, uh, with a new heading. Oh. <laughs> with someone okay. making money through plagiarism on YouTube. <laughs> gotcha. No, it, we, we've, we've been corrupted. Yep. The, the financial system is corrupt. I mean, United Way has 95% overhead. United wow. Way, yeah, the Heart Fund, 95% overhead. The Cancer Society, 95% overhead. Five cents of the no donations goes to the research. We don't need cancer research. We already have cancer cures. Man, you are, you are fascinating. Thank you so much for being on this show. The pleasure, and I hope to be back. I think, we were, I think you had me on uh, like a year or two ago. This is the first time for Portfolio Wealth Global. We have um, sister channels, though, that you were probably on, and I would love to have you back. I, I just think you're amazing. I could let this go for days, but... I'm well I run out of voice <laughs> right okay I run out of voice I run out of water I'm pretty low on my little jug right here there you go <clears throat> thank you Mr. Jim Willie editor-in-chief and founder of the hat trick newsletter and goldenjackass.com for the industry experts panel I'm Michelle Holiday at portfolio wealth global.com